presenting the first of two brand new presentations that I've never inflicted upon an audience before, so I hope you enjoy it. It's about the, the Franklin's Lost Expedition, and that relates to an expedition to find and conquer, at last, the elusive Northwest Passage. Now, ever since Marco Polo had travelled to from in, uh, Italy to China and the Far East in the 11th century, men had been searching for ways, Europeans had been searching for ways to get to the Far East uh, in a much more efficient, uh, safer and faster manner. Now, at the time, uh, the only way, the only routes that they had available to them were either overland, as Marco Polo did, or uh, down by a ship, uh, down uh, south across the equator, uh, down to the far reaches of the Southern Ocean, around um, the bottom of South America or South Africa, where the, the world's fiercest oceans and most dangerous oceans were uh, reputed to be. And then turning north again, once again heading far north across the equator again uh, to the Far East. And so they were always looking for a way to improve that. And what they wanted to find was a route through the Northern Hemisphere, through the Northwest Passage. Um, from the, either from the Atlantic through to the Pacific or vice versa. And people had searched for this for, for centuries. Now, there was a man um, who was the second secretary of the British Admiralty by the name of Sir John Barrow. He had that position for over 40 years from uh, 1804. He is widely regarded as the man that made the, the British Navy the most uh, professional fighting unit uh, in the world, the most powerful navy in the world as well. He looked into innovations for ships and, and created new ships. He, uh, he standardised the, the, the uh, training for, for captains and, and for his, their crews. He, uh, he made sure that promotion was on merit alone, not um, who your family knew. And this was very effective for the British Navy. Um, and as he drew to the end of his career, he had overseen several wars. He had fought wars against the Dutch. Uh, he had fought uh, and, and conquered Napoleon. And um, he also fought uh, the Americans in the War of 1812. Um, and it was now a time of peace. And instead of sending uh, ships away on missions of war, he wanted to send them away on missions of discovery. And over several years, he'd sent ships out to uh, the, An the Arctic, the Antarctic, uh, through to Africa, where they explored the continent of Africa, all through Asia and the Pacific as well. And, but as he came to the end of his career, he was 82 years old by the time he retired, uh, he wanted one last hurrah. He wanted to, to tackle the biggest one of all. He wanted to find a route uh, of the Northwest Passage. Now, this was, there'd been several expeditions before, and they knew for sure that um, they were never going to make it through in wintertime. Uh, the area of the Northwest Passage was actually clogged with ice all through winter. So there was only a small window of opportunity to get through, and this was through the summer months, which usually only lasted uh, two to three months. Uh, so they, uh, he wanted to try and get through during that time, knowing that uh, there was no charts or maps of the area. There's, ob there's obviously no satellite navigation um, or satellite photos. So it was going to be trial and error trying to get through here. And uh, he decided that um, he would select the very best people available. He would uh, make sure that this expedition was the best resourced, most scientifically advanced expedi expedition of all time, and that this, ex this one, this time, they would succeed. His first choice, uh, or as a, out of respect, uh, the first person he re approached to lead the expedition was a man by the name of Sir William Parry. Now, Parry had already been to the Arctic and explored the Arctic uh, on three occasions. He, at that time, held the record for going the furthest north. Um, he had got closer to the North Pole than any other man, obviously, apart from Santa Claus. Um, but um, but uh, he was, he was a, an expert at Arctic survival. But he, at the age of 55, he'd had enough exploring and he wanted a quiet, sedate life and retire to the countryside. Uh, and, uh, and Barrow probably knew that, because the person he really wanted to lead this expedition was a dashing young man by the name of Sir James Clark Ross. Now, Ross didn't have any experience in the Arctic, 
but he'd been very successful as an Antarctic explorer. He'd taken some ships down to Antarctica and um, filled in a lot of the, the lines on the map of, of Antarctica, filled in the charts, the missing pieces of what was down in Antarctica. And the, the Ross Sea and the Ross Ice Shelf uh, in Antarctica are, are named in his honour. But um, he had just married a beautiful young girl who, um, who wanted to start a family. So he was torn between going to on this expedition with a bunch of smelly men or staying with his beautiful young bride and, um, and starting a family. So guess which one he chose? Um, and so he also passed over the opportunity to command this, this mission. He recommended um, the person that he thought was best qualified for the role, which was his best friend and the man who had been the best man at his wedding. And that was a man by the name of Francis Crozier. So Crozier had accompanied uh, Ross on the mission to Antarctica. He was seen as a very capable man, an intelligent man, someone with common sense. Uh, he was a good leader. His men respected him. Uh, so he was the obvious choice. But he came with a couple of problems. And before I said that um, Barrow liked to promote people on merit, well, that had its limits. Um, and the limit was the fact that Crozier was an Irishman. And there was no way that uh, Barrow was going to allow an Irishman to get the honour of conquering the Northwest Passage. If someone was going to do it, it had to be an Englishman. The other tr problem with Crozier was that he was of common birth. Uh, he wasn't a gentleman by birth. He had risen up through the ranks and now uh, he still was rough around the edges. So that was unacceptable as well. So he was passed over for the command of the mission, even though he was probably the best person for the job. And command was offered to another man by the name of Sir John Franklin. Now, Franklin was born in, the U in England in um, 1786, which made him 59 at the time of this expedition. So it was fairly old for, a, for an Arctic explorer. Well, very old for an Arctic explorer. He was the ninth of 12 children, and his father had wanted him to go into the church. Uh, but at the age of 14, he convinced his father that uh, he wanted a life at sea and he was allowed to join the Royal Navy. In the year that followed, when he was 15, uh, he was part of uh, the British uh, victory against the Danes at the Battle of Copenhagen. And then a year later, as a young midshipman, he was sent out to Australia and he accompanied Matthew Flinders on the first circumnavigation of Australia. So a bit of Australian history there. He went back to England and was an officer aboard a ship of the line during the Battle of Trafalgar when uh, Nelson beat um, Napoleon's navy. And then in 1819, uh, he was given command of the Copper Mine mission. Now, this was a mission, uh, a Royal Navy mission, but it was an overland mission, which was strange for its time. And it was a mission to go from Hudson Bay in Canada uh, up the... the the Copper Mine River to the north of Canon to explore the northern reaches of the Canadian border and do some mapping along that border, that Arctic border, uh, and which was once again in preparation for uh, trying to find a way through the Northwest Passage. Now, by any way you want to look at it, this mission was a disaster. Uh, he was, he only, it was very under-resourced. He was only able to take four other Royal Navy personnel and he was told to recruit some other uh, local trappers and traders within, the, uh, within Canada. Once the experienced trappers and traders, who were known as the, the Travellers, uh, found out about the mission, they wanted nothing to do with it. So he was only able to recruit some men who knew little, if anything, about the region that they, they were heading into. Um, so... 20 men set off on this mission um, and it was fraught with peril from the beginning. They had very little food, there was poor preparation and planning. Um, along the way they were supposed to meet Indians who were supposed to supply them with food but that never happened. And later on uh, Franklin was widely criticised in Canada because of the planning that he put into this mission. It was said by his men who accompanied him that uh, he was so unfit that he could only walk 8 miles per day. Um, where the norm at the time was to make at least 12 to 15 miles per day. They said that he wanted to stop every few hours so he could have some tea. So he wasn't the intrepid explorer you would expect for this sort of type of thing. He, he was a, he's a naval officer. Um, now, they, uh, they did finally reach the, the northern um, outskirts of the northern border of, of Canada, but uh, by this time, the mission, everyone in the mission in the party was starving. 
and uh, they were living on on uh, tree bark and moss and, and other things that they could scra scavenge. Uh, it even got to the stage where Franklin had to cut up pieces of his boots and eat his boots, and he later became known as the man who ate his boots. And um, and Charlie Chaplin uh, had heard about this during his uh, when he was growing up in London, and he used it in his movie, in 1925 movie, The Gold Rush, in which the tramp um, goes off into the wilds of Alaska to try and make his fortune. But he, uh, he was starving, and he ex actually has to boil up his boots and eat his boots. And that came from uh, the Franklin Copper Mine Expedition. Um, the mission, they returned, they didn't do any mapping in, in the in the northern region, that they failed at that. Uh, and on the way back, uh, Franklin was accused of deserting some of his men, leaving some of his men behind, uh, who couldn't uh, go on any further. And he was, the mission was also accused that there was murder, there was murder afoot and there was also cannibalism. Um, so by all accounts, it wasn't very successful at all. He, uh, he was only saved at the very last moment when, when they were about to die when they stumbled across some Iroquois Indians who, who were able to feed them and take them back to Hudson's Bay. So the Canadians panned this mission, said it was, was a disgrace uh, and that he shouldn't have been able to... Um, he, he should be ashamed of himself. But there was a different spin in England, absolutely different spin. Over there, they loved him. Uh, they said this was a miraculous mission, even though only nine of the 20 men had returned. Uh, uh, Franklin was, was deemed a national hero. Uh, there was reports of him fighting off wild animals. I mean, they would have loved to have seen a wild animal. They might have been able to kill it and eat it. Um, there are reports of him fighting uh, hostile Indians. The only Indians he ever came across were the ones that actually saved his life at the end of the mission. Um, so, but, but he was seen in, in uh, England as this, this marvellous hero. He was actually knighted and awarded a gold medal by the Royal Society. Later on, in 1836, he was appointed as Lieutenant Governor of Van Diemen's Land, which we now know as Tasmania. And I'll talk, he was, his wife made more of an impact than he did uh, in, in Tasmania, and I'll talk about that later. And then, as you know, in 1845, he was made the officer commanding the British Naval Expedition to the Northwest Passage. Um, Frank Crozier was, was made his, um, his second in command. Uh, these two had met before in Tasmania. Um, Crozier had been part of the Ross expedition. He had commanded one of the ships and they'd used Hobart as their base both before and after they had gone down to the Antarctic. During the time he was in Hobart for the very first time, uh, Lady Franklin introduced Crozier to Franklin's niece and the two fell in love. And when uh, Crozier returned from Antarctica to Hobart, he actually proposed marriage and she turned him down uh, on the basis that he didn't, she didn't want to marry someone who was going to go off exploring all the time and she didn't know when he was going to return or if he was going to return at all. And uh, the two of them were, were both um, uh, heartbroken about this decision. Uh, he, the, both of them never married and um, Franklin's niece actually wrote poetry later, which was published, which talks about her, uh, her long-lost love who went away to sea and never returned. They were, were given two ships for this, um, for this expedition, HMS Terran and HMS Erebus. Now, they're not exactly... I mean, Erebus is the name of the entrance to hell. So as, um, as warships, they might be good names, but as ships of discovery, eh, not so much. Uh, wouldn't give you much confidence, would they? Um, now, these, these ships had a, had a history of themselves. They had both been the ships that uh, Ross had taken to the Antarctic. Um, Crozier had actually commanded the, the terror during that expedition. And uh, Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano in the world, is named after this ship. HMS Terror had a bit of a history in herself as well. She was built as a a gun platform, an artillery platform, and she was built in time for the War of 1812 between uh, the US and uh, Great Britain. And during that time, uh, ships like Terra went across to um, the American uh, continent and blockaded ports along the American coast. Now, it, they, he 
Terran participated in one particular battle which is of note, and that is the, the Battle of Baltimore. The British decided that they want to invade Baltimore. And, um, but at the time, uh, a young solicitor from Baltimore, a lawyer from Baltimore by the name of Francis Scott Key, uh, was asked by the local authorities to go to the British and try and negotiate a prisoner exchange. Now, he took a schooner out to the British flagship and went aboard the British flagship and he negotiated that, uh, that exchange. And then he was invited to dinner with the senior officers, the British officers, and it, where he was told that um, he was uh, going to be a guest of the, the British for a few days because he had, come, he had seen the strength and discipline disposition of the, the British Navy and or the British force and he now knew most of their plans to attack Baltimore Harbour. So Francis Scott Key was, was aboard the British flagship when HMS Terror and other ships attacked Baltimore Harbour. Baltimore Harbour is protected by a pentagon shaped uh, fortress within the harbour known as Fort McHenry um, and the British knew that they would have to conquer Fort McHenry to be able to get through to, to conquer Baltimore. The Americans had been smart though. They had scuttled or sunk some, some ships within the shipping channel so the British Navy couldn't get close enough to Fort McHenry. And so they had to bombard the fort from maximum distance, uh, which is very, very inaccurate. They used the, the ships like Terry used their, their cannon, but they also used a new weapon that they'd um, um, that Barrow had brought into the, the Navy, which was rockets. And so from a, ma a, a maximum range, they bombarded Fort McHenry uh, with these, these shells and with these rockets over, over a, a period of 18 hours. Uh, and the, the battle was largely ineffective. Because of the range, um, the accuracy was very poor. And uh, in terms of a, a battle, it was largely insignificant. Only Four American, there was only four American casualties and they were self-inflicted casualties and there was only one casualty on the British side. So insignificant, apart from the fact that Francis Scott Key um, got to witness this battle and he went, to, he went back to Baltimore and he wrote a poem called The Defence of Fort McHenry. <coughs> and in that poem he writes about the rocket's red glare, the star-spangled banner, um, the land of the free, home of the brave. And in later years, that poem was, there was music put to that poem and the, the name was changed to the Star Spangled Banner and of course that's the national anthem of the United States. Now, the irony of this is that um, um, Key's family had a, had a bit of a history themselves. His son was um, shot and killed by a United States congressman from New York because he was having an affair with the congressman's wife. Um, this congressman went to trial and was the first person in the US acquitted of a crime um, with the defence of temporary insanity. Now Francis Scott Key's grandson, and this is even more ironic, um, he was a newspaper publisher in Baltimore and he had published articles very critical of the reasons for and the conduct of the American Civil War. And so on the orders of America's most respected president, Abraham Lincoln. Um, he and the mayor of Baltimore and some other distinguished gentlemen from Baltimore were arrested without warrant and held imprisoned without trial on the very same uh, Fort McHenry for the duration of the Civil War. So there's been a lot of speculation and, and contemplation about whether Francis Scott Key would have ever written the words Land of the Free if he'd known that um, his own grandson was going to be imprisoned without trial for voicing his own opinion. So <laughs> These ships, um, as I said, they'd been to the Antarctic. They were now refitted again and they were uh, refitted with uh, four inches of steel plating around the, the hull of the ship. The bows of the ship were, were reinforced even further. They were the first British ships ever to be, uh, have steam engines installed uh, inside them and propellers uh, inst installed for propulsion, um, which was new technology at the time. The, this would give them a speed of four knots, which doesn't sound very much because I mean, most of us can walk at more than four knots. Uh, 
but at the time it gave them some sort of propulsion and they were able to use that to, they thought they'd be able to use it to get through the ice and, and with propulsion through the ice when there was no wind. It also had some other features that had never been seen before, like internal heating of the ships, and they also had a library of over a thousand books on board so that the men would have something to do if they were trapped in the, uh, in the ice for a winter or two. And there was also more technology. Um, tin canned food had been just been invented, and so they were to take three years' supply of canned food, more than 8,000 tins, uh, with them on this journey. And that was going to be a godsend to them because they wouldn't have to forage for food. Now, normally, as second in command, Crozier would select the crew. Um, but that job was, uh, Franklin gave that job to another man, uh, the captain of the Erebus, uh, James Fitzjames. Uh, and he selected people that uh, he had sailed with before and chaps that he knew quite well. And, um, and Crozier complained at one, or questioned at one stage, about why there was no one else. There was only four people in the whole expedition that had any experience on the ice. And he was told, don't worry about it, there's no need, we're not even going to set foot on the ice. Uh, we're just going to sail through the Northwest Passage, we've got all the food we need, uh, things are fine. We've got propulsion on these ships, we will not have to go anywhere near the ice. Um, so, so they sailed from England with much, much fan fanfare on the 19th of May, 1845. And if you read the newspaper reports at the time, there was absolute confidence in this mission that um, things would go well. They didn't talk about whether the mission would succeed. It was so positive that it would succeed. They talked about how good it was going to be, how much trade it was going to generate when they found a way through the Northwest Passage. So confidence was very high. There was 24 officers and 110 men on board, and they sailed for Scotland first, and then to Disco Bay on the coast of Greenland. Uh, at Disco Bay, the men wrote their... Uh, final letters, and uh, five men were discharged by Franklin uh, and sent home. He didn't, he didn't feel that they were fit for the mission. Um, now, some of these letters are very interesting as well. Um, there was letters from officers who, who once again were full of confidence. There was one young officer who, who was sad that he thought they were only going to get, th he were going to get through the ice and through the passage straight away, and he lamented that he'd like to spend at least one winter uh, on the ice, stuck in the ice during uh, this voyage, and uh, he got more than he bargained for. So on the 29th of July, 1845, um, these two ships, the Erebus and the Terror, were last seen by two uh, American whaling vessels. The crews uh, exchanged waves to each other and cheers, and then uh, the two English ships disappeared into the ice flow. And Franklin's 129 men were never seen or heard from again. Now, Lady Jane Franklin, now she was a very formidable woman. Uh, it was said that she was a woman of great mental activity. Now, whether that means that she was, was intelligent or whether it means that she had a vivid imagination, I'm not really sure. She, it might have been both. But she was a very uh, well-respected woman. When her husband was the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania, she travelled to the mainland of Australia and was actually the very first woman to travel overland between Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, she was concerned in uh, Hobart in Tasmania about the level of um, unemployment and, and feared that this unemployment would lead to crime. Convicts had been released from Port Arthur Prison after serving their sentence, and, but they had no work to go to. So she bought 640 acres of prime property in the Huon Valley of Tasmania. Uh, and she interviewed over 200 people and selected 73 of them and broke up this land that she'd purchased and gave these, these, uh, this land to these people and suggested that they um, start planting things like apples. And that started the, the apple industry in Tasmania. And Tasmania, for those who don't know, is now, is now called the Apple Isle. It's so famous for its apples. After a year, she hadn't heard from her husband, uh, she went to the Admiralty and said, you know, aren't you going to do something about this? Um, I'm concerned. I, don't, I think something's wrong. Uh, can you send a search party? The Admiralty said, 
No, I mean, everything's fine. I mean, they've got three years' supply. We didn't really expect them to make it through the first year. They only had a small window to get through. Um, they had to, they were going to have to go up and down the different channels to find, try and find a route through. Don't worry, everything's fine. In the second year, she hadn't heard anything from her husband. So she went back to the Admiralty again. And um, once again, they said, well, they've got three years' supply of food. There's nothing to worry about. Just leave it a bit longer. She wasn't satisfied with that, so she went to the newspapers and started a campaign, a public campaign, to put pressure on the Admiralty to send a rescue mission, a search mission, for her husband and his men. In the end, she funded seven missions herself um, through her own money and through public sponsorship. Um, and her, one of her legacies is that these seven missions that she, she sent uh, actually mapped a lot of the coasts of uh, what we now know as Canada and Greenland and other, other islands and, and air things in the Arctic Circle. So a lot of the knowledge we have of that area comes from, from Lady Franklin's, another one of her, um, her legacies. Eventually, there was a lot of pressure put on the British Admiralty and they decided they had to act. So they decided they were going to send uh, two search missions, one a, a naval search mission and one overland to search for Franklin and his men. And this is a, a photo, I'm sorry it's not a good quality photo uh, or a painting, um, but it's uh, uh, the planning mission for at the Admiralty and these are all famous Admiralty people of the time and they're planning the, ex the search mission for Franklin. And you probably can't see it, but in the background there, uh, there's a portrait of Sir John Franklin himself. They also set a reward of £20,000 for anyone who would find uh, Franklin and his men or give assistance to Franklin and his men or have any information about Franklin and his men. And so this, this is worth about £1.8 million or £2.5 million US dollars in today's currency. So it's a lot of money and it, it encouraged people like the American whalers to go uh, searching for, for Franklin and his men privately and there was a lot of, of people went up there privately to search for the, for the men. After several years of searching, um, one of the expeditions came across a place called Beachy Island and on Beachy Island they found um, a grim sight. There was three graves uh, of three of Franklin's men who had obviously died in the very first stages. The headstone said that they died in the first winter of, uh, of the expedition. So why had three men died so soon after the beginning of the mission? It was a mystery. There was no other information there. Um, and these three men were, were uh, a petty officer by the name of John Torrington, a rural marine by the name of Brain, and an a able seaman, uh, John Hartnell. And they were all fit, healthy men when, men when they left. So why had they died so soon into the expedition? It was another mystery. And it seemed that they'd reached Beachy Island, which is up here. And what we now know is that they travelled down this Wellington Strait here and came into to the northern area of King William Island. And it seems that as they came down that island, they didn't realise it, but the ice was following them down and they became trapped at the northern part of King William Island. And they were going to be trapped there. They thought they might be trapped there for one winter, but it turns out that uh, they never got out of that, that ice trap. Now, the first sign, any wor first word of anything to do with the Franklin and his men came nine years after they went missing. Uh, where they sailed out. And this was from a man by the name of John Ray, who was travelling overland. He wasn't actually searching for Franklin and his men, he was on another mission, and he came across some Inuits, um, local, local Inuit um, population. And these men had items with them that had belonged to men of the Franklin expedition. And Ray questioned them and said, where did you get this stuff? And they indicated that uh, on King William Island, uh, there were many bodies there and that um, the men, the white men on the island had resorted to cannibalism to survive for a while, but eventually they had all died. So Ray wrote a report back to the Admiralty on what he had found, and he indicated in that report that his poor countrymen were driven to the last resource of cannibalism. 
When that report reached London, Lady Franklin was absolutely furious. She would have nothing of this. Um, her husband, her darling husband, would not allow this to happen. There would be no cannibalism on a mission that, uh, that he commanded. Um, so she did a big campaign through the, uh, the British Parliament and also the Admiralty, and John Ray was denied any part of the reward that he was entitled to. Uh, years later, so this is um, uh, another five years later, uh, another ex person went looking for Franklin and they travelled down uh, that channel to King William Island and uh, Francis McClintock found a can of stones or a mound of stones that were uh, obviously man-made. He broke into that can and found a, a metal box uh, with a message inside the box. And the message was from Franklin. And it was scrawled on a piece of Admiralty paper. And this is the message here from Franklin. And it gives details that the ship was were stuck in ice at Beachy Island and they, they descended through the Wellington Channel and uh, to their, their present location. And it's signed off by Sir John Franklin. And then he says, all's well. And this was dated the 28th of May, 1847. Now, around the outside of that same piece of paper, another message was scrawled. But this was scrawled 11 months later, on the 25th of April, 1848. And it's from um, uh, Captain Crozier. And in it, he says, it's 28th of April, 1848, Her Majesty, his, his Majesty's ships, uh, Terra and Erebus, were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues north-northwest of the position. Um, the officers and crews consisting of 105 souls under the command of Crozier landed here. He went on to say, and this was the first news anyone had heard of it, that Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847. So this is only two weeks after Franklin had written this first note. And that the total loss of, by deaths in the expedition had been, been nine officers and 15 men. And it's signed by, signed by um, Fitzjames and by Crozier. And it also says that they're planned to start to the... Uh, the Backs Fish River the following day. They planned to try and make it to that river the following day. Now, this was over a thousand miles away. That was the considered to be the closest civilization to them and their only hope of survival. In fact, the, the first tree they would have come across was over 500 miles away. That's how barren and desolate this, this icy land is. So it became clear now that they deserted the ship and tried to make it overland to survive. Now McClintock came across another discovery. It was a longboat from the, um, from the ship, one of the ships. And inside the longboat he, he made a gruesome discovery. There was two skeletons. One was in fairly good condition, but the other one had broken bones. And in the bones it had nicks in the bones, which looked like the they had tried to cut the skin away from the bones. Uh, so that was a bit confusing for them. Now what was also confusing that is that if you were trying to uh, make your way across the ice, dragging these heavy boats, you would only take with you the, the bare essentials of survival, wouldn't you? But inside this boat they found things like books and they found brass curtain rods and mirrors and other assorted things. They also found 40 pounds of chocolate, which confirmed that there was no women on board the expedition because that would have been consumed. <laughs> but why would they starve to death if there was 40 pounds of chocolate with them? It didn't make any sense at all. The other thing was that the, uh, the boat was facing back towards where the ships were. So had these men been trying to make their way back to the ships and had other men actually made it back to the ships, we'd, we'd, it uh, posed more questions than it answered. And what we now know is that they deserted the ship at this position up here, which is Crozier Point, and they made their way, Crozier led them along the, the coastline of King William Island, uh, down uh, across the peninsula here into the, um, into what the Canadian uh, mainland. Now, obviously not all the men made it, and along this route here, uh, there's archaeologists have found several sites where uh, bodies of men uh, have been discovered. Now, some of these men are in singles and there's pairs, uh, and there's up to 20, in one place there's 29 bodies. And some of these men are laid out in rows, 
uh, very neat and some are sprawled across the, the countryside. So uh, whether they, uh, some men were left and told that uh, people would come back for them at some stage, uh, we don't know. So, uh, but all across that, uh, that uh, route, uh, it's strewn with bodies and it's also strewn with, with artefacts that have been found. So it seems that these men had to uh, haul, manhaul, uh, these boats across the ice um, for miles and miles and miles. Now an experiment was done just a few years ago where a, a group of recruits of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were uh, recruited to um, be part of this expedition. And 105 of them, so the equal amount as what was the survivors that were left, were given three boats, three long boats of the same size and the same weight as Crozier and his men would have had. And they were told to man sled these boats as far as they could. And um, there's actually a YouTube video of this, and it's pretty interesting to watch because in the first instance, um, these guys are joyful and happy and boisterous and they're joking amongst each other. And you've got to remember, these people hadn't spent two and a half years uh, trapped in the ice uh, and they'd, they were fit and healthy and well clothed. And so during the first hour, they're racing against each other and having a great time. Um, after a couple of hours, not so much. And uh, as the day wore on, after eight hours, they were absolutely physically exhausted. They were bussed back to their mess, and there's footage of some of them fall, who had fallen asleep uh, as they were eating their meals. And it estimated that they had consumed at least 10,000 calories in that one day of pulling these, these boats. And how far had they made it? Four miles. <laughs> so these were fit young men and they'd made it four miles in good conditions. Um, Crozier and his men had to make it a thousand miles, so, and they knew that. So how would they feel when they're making such little progress? Their hopes of, they must have known their hopes of survival were, were almost nil. As I said, there was lots of artefacts found along the way, including a, an officer's uh, pocket watch, uh, a Royal Marine cap badge, and this was a tin that would have had contained uh, tea. Uh, the, the people who had gone through and, and um, tried to find Franklin, the searchers, had also taken lots of pages of testimony from local Inuits. And this was init initially re uh, disregarded as being unreliable. And, uh, but later on, uh, more and more uh, credence was put into these testimonies. And in one instance, uh, two Inuits were in interviewed and they said they had come across a group of about 30 men while they were dog sledding across King William Island. And uh, these men were indicated to them that they were very hungry and they'd like some food. And uh, uh, the Inuits gave them some seal meat. Uh, the Inuits were scared of these men. Uh, they, were, they were looking at the, uh, the dogs that the Inuits had and the Inuits were worried that they were going to try and steal the dogs or eat the dogs or, or something. So they fled, uh, left leaving these men. They also testified that uh, there was nothing they could do to help these men anyway. Um, there was there's so little food um, on King William Island that there was only enough to sustain a small group of Inuits. There was no way that they could cater for 30 men or 105 men. There wasn't enough food source in the area to do that. Another testimony from an, from an Inuit was that he came across one of the ships and uh, he ventured on board. When he went down into the bowels of the ships, he was greeted by some men with, with black faces and black teeth. Now, this could have been caused by scurvy because uh, black, uh, black gums and, and face are one of the, um, the symptoms of scurvy. But it also could have come from the soot from the steam engines or, or any other number of factors. Um, but uh, this Inuit gave evidence that uh, these men were very, very happy to see him initially until they found out he was on his own. And then they started grabbing at him. And a young man came out of another room, another cabin, and uh, told the men to leave him alone. This young man, who was probably an officer, took the Inuit up onto the top deck and told him to stay away uh, from this area. It was too dangerous to be here. Uh, go away and tell your people. He also indicated a position about 400 metres away and uh, told the Inuit, uh, don't go there, lots of danger there, stay away, warn your people. 
Now later on, that was that was as I said disregarded by uh, by. Uh, people at the time, but later on uh, that was investigated and 400 metres from where the ship had been, uh, archaeologists discovered a site where there were hundreds of bones and on all these bones there were nick marks again which showed that there was cannibalism and the ends of the bones had been boiled in water which would have been used to suck the marrow out of the bones by these starving men. So there was no doubt that cannibalism was involved. In uh, in 1986, as, as, as recent as 1986, um, uh, some archaeologists applied to the Canadian government to uh, exhume the bodies of the three men who were found on Beachy Island to see whether this could offer any clues to what had happened to Franklin and his men. Now in the second I'm going to put up a, a, um, a slide which shows some dead bodies. Um, if um, They're not graphic, but if anyone um, uh, wants to... That I'll turn away and I'll let you know when it's safe to turn back. So these were the three men who were, were found at Beachy Island. And as you can see, uh, they were in fairly good condition. That's Torrington, um, uh, Brain and Hartnell. Uh, and they were autopsied. And uh, in the autopsy, it was found that they had extremely high levels of lead in their systems. Now, London was a very um, industrial city at the time and they had high levels of lead, but these guys had 10 times that level of lead in their system that you would expect from an industrial city like London. And how could you explain that? Well, it, it came down to... They also discovered tin cans. Now, the, uh, the person who had won the contract, the company that won the contract to supply the tin food, was only a brand new supplier. This was new technology, remember. And they were given the contract on April Fool's Day, 1845, which is fairly appropriate. And they only had seven weeks to fulfil that order of 8,000 cans. And their workmanship was very shoddy. They'd actually soldered the tops of the cans with lead uh, and a very sloppy job. So when these cans were being heated up to be consumed, that solder would have dripped down into the food source and contaminated the men. It wouldn't be a reason why the men died, it wouldn't be a cause of death, but it would have contributed to that death. Now also the steam engine, now this was once again new technology, and uh, it was used to propel, uh, obviously water has to go through the engine to create steam, and then the water was siphoned off in through a distillery, uh, distilling uh, um, process and came out the other end. But um, that distilling process was also made of lead. So this was also poisoning the men. Uh, and as I said, the lead poisoning didn't kill them, but lead poisoning causes confusion and irritation and things like that. So it would have contributed to what was happening all around and the stresses that the men would have been under. Another interesting footnote, uh, one of the ships that was sent to look for Franklin and his men was the HMS Resolute. It, along with four other ships, were sent out um, to the region searching for Franklin and four of these ships, including the Resolute, themselves became stuck in ice, um, which wasn't a good look. Fearing that um, the same fate would befall them, they were ordered to leave the ship, uh, evacuate over the ice to the one remaining ship and return to England. The captain of the Resolute protested this order. Uh, he said that he was happy to stay with the ship and then come summer uh, they would sail back to England, but he was overruled and told to abandon the ship. So he made the ship as ship shape as possible. He stowed away the sails and everything else and, and battened everything down. And he and his men tramped across the ice to the one remaining ship and headed back to England. Uh, about 16 months later, an American whaling vessel came across the Resolute more than a thousand miles from its, uh, uh, the position where it had been um, abandoned. And uh, they put a crew on board and sailed the vessel back to Boston where the American government decided to purchase the vessel. Uh, the United States had been at war with the Great Britain twice in the previous 80 years and the American government wanted to make a gesture of friendship to the British government. So they purchased the vessel for the sum of $40,000, which was a fortune at the time, restored the ship and then sailed it across the Atlantic and on the 13th of December they presented it to Queen Victoria who personally came down to accept the gift uh, from the American people. Um, now HMS Resolute stayed in service with the Royal Navy for the following 25 years but um, 
when she was finally decommissioned and, and it was about to be broken up, Queen Victoria ordered that three pieces of furniture be made from the, the timbers of the Resolute. And one of them was the Resolute desk, which she presented to <coughs> President uh, Rutherford B. Haynes in 1880. And that's, of course, the desk that sits in the White House and has been used by American presidents, uh, most American presidents ever since then, and, and has been used to this day. Now, very recently, both the, the Terror and the Erebus have been found. The Erebus was found in September 2014, and then two years later, almost to the day, the Terror was also found. And they were both found in areas that the Inuits had indicated they were going to be found. Um, so that testimony that they gave was important. The Erebus isn't in very good condition. It is, um, it is they're both in, sunk in very shallow waters, but the, apparently the Terror is in quite good condition. Um, now, these are both protected sites. They've been protected by the Canadian government, and you can't go there. Uh, but they're doing study on, on the, the ships as we speak. Um, now, it seems what happened is that, as I said, they were stuck in the ice on the northern part of King William Island. Uh, when the ice broke free after a few summers, it seems that the Erebus has drifted down and has come to... to um, uh, sunk in this position down here, uh, broken up and sunk, probably crushed by the ice. The Terror, however, uh, according to the reports that I've seen, looks like it might have been sailed for a period of time. Uh, the position of the anchor and the position of the rigging, it looks like somebody has tried to sail the ship again. So whether it broke out of the ice and some of the men were on board and tried to sail it, but it only made it as far as what is now known as Terror Bay, where it too sunk and is, is still there, obviously. Now, Sir Lady, oh, sorry, Lady Jane Franklin, um, as I said, was a very determined woman. She wanted to make sure that her husband had a legacy and would never be forgotten. So there's tributes to Franklin all around the world. There's islands named after him. There's straits named after him. There's, um, um, there was a portion of, of, a, of Canada, a large portion of Canada, that was named Franklin up until fairly recently when it was changed to an Indigenous name. Uh, there's also statues of Franklin in his home uh, county of Lincolnshire and in uh, uh, Hobart in Tasmania. And the Franklin River in Tasmania is named for Franklin as well. And that was a famous river Australians would know about. It was the scene of a, a big controversy about 30 years ago when they tried to dam the Franklin River. Um, and there's also a, Frank, a, a statue of Franklin in the Naval um, College in Greenwich in London. And they've taken a little bit of poetic license with this one. Um, on, the, on the inscription uh, on that monument, it says, To the great Arctic navigator and his brave companions who sacrificed their lives in completing the discovery of the Northwest Passage. <laughs> well, not so much. <laughs> but they, yeah. Um, that honour actually went to a, another man, a Norwegian by the name of Roald Amundsen. Now we, now, we all know that um, Armiston was the first man to reach the South Pole. He, uh, he beat Scott and his doomed men. Um, now, he, did that, he made that trek extremely efficient, efficiently. He actually left the Bay of Wales in Antarctica well after Scott had left on his journey to the South Pole. But he arrived at the South Pole a full 34 days before Scott and his men got there to see the Norwegian flag flying. And he was also able to return safely uh, to the Bay of Wales and, and sail back to Norway. He didn't consider that his greatest achievement. He considered his greatest achievement the fact that he had discovered a way through the Northwest Passage. He, he went from the Atlantic through the Pacific. It took him three years to do so, but it shouldn't have. He didn't need to take three years. Uh, he actually volunteered to stay on the ice for a, a year longer than he needed to. And that's because during the first winter that he was uh, going through the ice, he became stuck in the ice just like Franklin. But instead of staying on board the ships, uh, or his ship, he ventured out onto the ice and he met some Inuit um, natives there. They befriended him and his men and uh, they started teaching him uh, some of the survival uh, techniques for uh, Arctic conditions. 
And at the time, European explorers wore layers upon layers of clothing. They had cotton uh, undergarments, followed by wool, followed by more wool, followed by um, uh, canvas, followed by oilskins, all these sorts of things to try and protect them from the elements. But the Inuits wore just a single layer of caribou fur. And Armisen was absolutely um, amazed at, the, at the, the lightness of this fur and also the warmth that it gave out. And it's now been shown, scientific um, uh, analysis of this caribou fur has shown that each individual hair on the caribou has these tiny pockets of air within the hair. And air is the best conductor of heat that there is. So it insulates very, very well. And um, so Armas has started using caribou fur, wearing that in preference to the uh, European garb. He was also shown how to create ice houses or igloos. And once again, ice has enormous amounts of, of air in, in it. And so while it might be minus 20 or minus 40 degrees outside, it's a lovely balmy minus one or two inside these igloos. <laughs> he also, they also taught him how to drive a dog sled and how to properly wear uh, snowshoes and how to hunt and fish in these conditions. And he actually stayed uh, to... Um, the despair of a few of his men, he actually volunteered to stay an extra, extra year to learn more from the Inuits. Um, they also taught him how to make their sledges much more efficient. And that was by taking, drinking, uh, taking water into your mouth and, and rolling it around your mouth for a while until it heated up a bit and then spitting it out onto a uh, caribou fur and then rubbing that fur along the, the rails of the sledge. Um, and putting a coating of ice on those rails. And it's since been scientifically proven that this makes these sledges 80% more efficient as they travel over the ice. So these things were the things that helped him conquer the, uh, the Antarctic and made him the, the first person to reach the South Pole. And uh, as I said, he considered um, uh, his conquest of the Northwest Passage his greatest achievement. So ladies and gentlemen, that ends the... Um, the, uh, the talk about Franklin and his men. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, um, uh, that's the first time I've done that. I hope it hasn't bored too many people. Um, my next presentation is going to be on day 19, and it's going in here at 3 o'clock again, and it's going to be a little bit of a fun one. Uh, we're going to talk about ghost ships, and during the process of that, we're going to work together, and we're going to solve one of the great maritime mysteries of all time. So hope you're up for it.